author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and today I'm at the University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington with Graham Simpson, author of The Best of Adam Sharp. Graham, welcome to Author. Good to talk to you. For those who don't know the story, it's pretty interesting. You came to it later in life, the de decision to pursue fiction writing. Yeah, look, I was 50 years old, um, and I'm 60 now. So I was 50 when I enrolled in um, an undergraduate course, um, a diploma course in, uh, in screenwriting. 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 I didn't think I had the chops to be a novelist. I didn't think I, I was up to it, but I thought I might be able to cut it as a screenwriter. So any screenwriters watching this, please don't be offended. <laughs> but I thought it would be easier to be a screenwriter because a screenplay is not a finished product. Um, right. A screenplay still has a lot of collaboration to go before you have it, whereas a novel, that's it. You've got to do the whole thing. But something must have transpired to draw you in. Did you start getting more interested in the descriptions of the settings as you were trying to write your screenplay? Nothing, How did it, nothing is romantic as that. What, what actually happened <laughs> was I couldn't get my movie made, oh. uh, which I should have guessed at the time. So having spent five years studying screenwriting, having spent all of that time working on essentially the same feature film project, and that was the Rosie Project. That was, that was the name of the, um, of the movie, ultimately, the screenplay that I wrote. Um, it got you know, well regarded, won a prize, all sorts of things like that, but of course nobody wanted to make it. And at that point, it was, it was a pragmatic thing. I said, I'm going to have to go back and write this thing as a novel or nobody will make it. And look, deep down, I wanted to be a novelist more than I wanted to be a screenwriter. Oh, you did? But you wouldn't oh, admit yeah. it to yourself? I wouldn't admit it to myself, no. Um, but at this point, I said, well, it's, I've got to do it. I don't have a choice about this if uh -huh. I want to get this movie made. <laughs> so I enrolled in a class in novel writing, but I didn't have to do much of that. I actually found that learning screenwriting, I'd acquired the storytelling skills, which were, and I already had reasonable prose skills from writing a lot of nonfiction. So, you know, and, and even writing nonfiction, you can be creative in the way you present things. I wrote a few short stories to, um, to limber up and look to test whether I could, knew what I was doing and felt reasonably happy with the results. They all got published. Um, so I thought, okay, I can write prose. I know the structure. I know how to do the character stuff. Um, I know how to work with editors, all of that. And, and then I wrote The Rosie Project, the, the draft of the novel, um, in three weeks. So I did not know that. Three weeks. Three weeks. But you had, now, was that partly due to having done it all out in entirely due. <laughs> entirely due. Okay. It was entirely due to me knowing the story and the characters inside out. It didn't out. change. It didn't change. Well, I, I added some stuff, but um, yeah, it's I did the it. same story. It's the same story. I added some flesh on the bones. I worked very hard over those uh, right. over those three weeks, but I had essentially a full draft at that time, and I spent four weeks tidying, rewriting, before um, submitting it to publishers, which was a really <laughs> don't, don't try this at home <laughs> without without an agent, any of those things. Oh, you okay? But, but my lucky break was I also submitted it to a an award for an unpublished manuscript, and it got shortlisted for the award. At that point, everybody sat up and, and took notice. It was a state award, the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. I actually won it, um, or the book actually won it in the end. But really, it was getting shortlisted that got attention, and, and suddenly I had publishers interested. When you sat down to write fiction, um, for the first time, I, unless, I'll include screenplays in that. What, sure. What surprised you the most? What did you find, what was the most surprising challenge to you? Okay, I think in, in writing screenplays, I think the, I wrote um, screenplays early on where I thought that the, the viewer would, would understand something in a certain way and I, under, and I realized that I was being, say, too subtle, too obtuse, yeah. and they were reading something different into it from what I'd intended. So that, that the surprise was that it, um, that in telling a story and in trying to leave some gaps for the imagination, that the imagination would fill those gaps in ways that I hadn't anticipated. That I teach a whole, in a way, class on that, which is that you're pointing at something, yep. but you can't touch it, yep. and you hope they see it. Yep. But you don't want to point too much because you don't want to fill in everything for them. It's a, 
it's an, that's why it's an art. It is, and that, that's, that's a real challenge to, to get that right, to get that balance. You don't want it to be on the nose, you don't want to be telling people... Explaining uh, things, your explaining, jokes. Explaining, so yep, explaining the jokes, explaining what's, what's going on when they should be able to see it, and it's show not tell. Yeah. But the showing has to be sufficiently unambiguous um, that people won't be led down the wrong path. When you, when you went to the right, the road, well, so first of all, we should say, Rosie Project, boom, yeah, right? right? And so what was that like for you? Because you're, you're a guy, you're having your life, and, okay. and all of a sudden, look, I had, a minor I had, celebrity. Yeah, look, I had the conversation with Hannah Kent, um, who wrote um, a book called Burial Rights, which has been very successful, particularly as literary fiction. And look, we both said, and I said, look, all authors, I think, says, our goal was to be published, to be published <laughs> right. by a mainstream <laughs> publisher, right. and, and, and they have the dream that one day you're going to walk into a bookstore, and in the back shelf, you know, spine out, there, there will be your book. Oh, can I sign this? I say, oh, uh, better not. We may need to send it back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but but yeah, that, 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 that's the limit of the ambition. Right. And in fact, at the point where I got that publishing contract, I actually looked at myself in the mirror, almost literally, and said, OK, Graham, you've got what you set out to do. Everything else is, is a bonus, is a plus. You will never, you know, you're going to have five minutes of saying we didn't make number one in the New York Times bestseller list. Um, we made two and just actually <laughs> haven't. We made two right. and just didn't quite do it. And you could have your five minutes like, ah! But, but don't ever you know, lose sleep over it or feel bad about it. You, everything we're doing is exceeding expectations. That must be really helpful because I think uh, writing is an in interesting game because you don't, there is, the, you, the bar that you set is your, is you set that bar, whatever it is, whatever you want to call success. And I think writers beat themselves up a lot because, oh, I got on this New York Times list, but I was only 20, I wasn't 15 or 10, or I oh, didn't, you know, you can, make, you can make up all kinds of rules for your own failure, in a way. Oh, look, look a absolutely. Um, and and look, it depends, you, you must understand what success and failure mean to you. Otherwise, you'll keep letting other people define that for you, and, and you'll always be unhappy, because you can be the biggest seller, you can be E.L. James, you're selling massive numbers, and, and the critics are beating, beating right. up on you. Alternatively, you win the Booker Prize, and you sell less copies in the Rosie Project, and you say, what is this? Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I think you've got to, you know, for me, um, my goal, because I, you know, I've now got my bestseller, so it's easy for me to say this. I simply want to write the best books that I possibly can by my own lights. And, and that's a way, you know, for me, if I wanted to go beyond that and, and talk about audience, I want to reach some people. I'd rather write a book that half the people hate, but half the people, or 20% of the people, are absolutely touched by it and take something. I'm, I'm writing for them. Doesn't sound like you, though, have had to wrestle with just a general doubt about yourself uh, that a great many that is what keeps is really the source of much of the block that writers face uh, is just doubting that this is worth the effort, worth the time, worth the well, attention. Look, look, I know that I can write something that the public um, and even critics are going to rate very high. Now. Yeah, did you, okay. But did you know so, that when you were writing The Rosie Project? Not, not, I'm not yeah, pointing well, to well, this, only, but The Rosie Project. <laughs> it only took me three weeks. So. Right. You didn't have a chance I, to even guess. I only, I only, to, I only had to suppress my, uh, <laughs> yeah, my fear um, for those three weeks or so, and then and things, things yeah. happened quickly. And with that behind me, I mean, what I, what I had to avoid was, which you alluded to before, was the, the pressure to outdo it every time, to, to, to live up right. to it and so forth. Right. Um, my creative hero is Bob Dylan. Um, Mine too. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's a, a great creative hero to have because he's produced some real garbage. And he just uh, keeps going. And he just doesn't stop. He keeps doing it. And, and I, I want to be where he is in a sense. Well, Nobel Prize would be great. Um, <laughs> but at the end of his life, and even you know, right now, he has a portfolio of work and it's ups and downs. Some might say his finest work was done in his mid-twenties. But he's done some very fine work in his thirties, in his forties, in his fifties. And he's done some junk, you know, some, some less competent stuff in between. But he's got a portfolio, and he will hopefully be judged not by his worst work, but by his finest work. Graham, I got one more question for you. And what I'd like you to do is finish this sentence for me. If writing has taught me anything, it's taught me what? It's taught me that people are more diverse in their response to the writing than I had thought possible. How long did it take you to realize that? Oh, Almost I, immediately? <laughs> no, well, I got a little bit of that when people, when I mentioned earlier, when people weren't picking up stuff yeah. um, that, that I was writing and I learned to, to 
make that less ambiguous, but um, you only need to read Goodreads. <laughs> <laughs>